Morning, friends. So uh, last Sunday, for those of you who weren't here, we started talking a little bit about the ugly business of forgiveness. And what we said was that when we talk about forgiveness in church, what we're really talking about, right, what we're really talking about is that time you were rejected. We're talking about that episode in your life when you were betrayed. We're talking about those horrible occasions when you were abused. We're talking about all the nights you found yourself unloved and unwanted. We're talking about all those decisions that your spouse made, that your parents made, that your children made, that brought hurt and pain into your life. In other words, when we talk about forgiveness, we're looking into your past and we're seeing with regret that your past should have been better. And were it not for the actions of other people, it would have been better. And in that regard, we looked together at the old filing cabinet. And we said for the purpose of this series, this old filing cabinet was going to represent your mind. And without being too psychobabbly about any of it, I suggested that in all probability, the people who robbed you of a better past are filed away somewhere in your mind. And the things they said to you and the things they did to you and the way they treated you are filed away somewhere in your mind. And you haven't, because you can't, made the decision to forgive them. You haven't made a deliberate and a conscious decision to set those people free in your heart. And here's the kicker. Insofar as you have not set them free, you're not free. The tragic irony is that in holding on to the events of your past, you're allowing those same events to rob you of a better today. That's just in a nutshell. In holding on to the events that robbed you of a better yesterday, you're allowing those same events to rob you of a better today and a better tomorrow. The word resentment, we learned last Sunday, means to feel again. So here's what you do, here's what I do, here's what we all do. Every now and again, consciously and subconsciously, we open up this filing cabinet of our past and we poke around in the wounds of yesterday and we go over it and over it and over it again and we feel it again and again and again. And when I say that, I am not at all trivialising the fact that your past could have been and should have been better. I'm not. When I decided to call this series Water Off a Duck's Back, I'm not suggesting that what happened to you is water off a duck's back. It isn't. All I'm saying is what's the point in living with resentment? What good is it doing you? What's the point in choosing to feel today what you had no choice in feeling yesterday? Surely it would be better to shake it off and get on with your life and enjoy it best you can. So this series is about saying, you know what, I'm sorry, but I've been hurt enough by what happened to me back then. And there is no point in me allowing the unchangeable events of yesterday to spoil my life today. The past is gone, it's done, it can't be undone. So I may as well get on with it and enjoy my life and move on. And so last Sunday we spoke about this episode, didn't we, in the life of Jesus. And that episode was just one of many that I could have chosen. Jesus, it feels at least when you read the Gospels, that Jesus spoke about forgiveness all the time. His sermons, his stories, his prayers were, were packed full of the language of letting things go, of shaking things off, of, of moving on from hurts. It's almost as if Jesus, as he looked at life, said, you know, hey guys, it's really obvious that as you go through this world, you're going to pick up hurts. And those hurts are real. 
And if you're going to make it on this journey of mine, you're going to have to learn to let things go. You're going to have to learn to forgive. You're going to have to forgo the right to have had a better past. You're going to have to forgo the right not to have been hurt by those people who shouldn't have hurt you. Jesus was really sticky on this point. Insistent, actually. You must practice forgiveness. You must shake things off and let things go. It isn't optional in Christianity. It's mandatory. So this week, I want to move on from that and look at how this, this forgiveness thing played out in the life of the early church. So let's bang our first Bible verse up on the screen and we'll, um, we'll get to our work. So we're looking at the letter of St. Paul to the church in Corinth here. And this, it's almost one of these insignificant verses in the Bible. Here's what it says. His letters are weighty and forceful, but in person he is unimpressive and his speaking amounts to nothing. Why are you laughing? Um, that, that's not referring to me. That is... <laughs> So what's going on in this sentence is a man called Paul is saying, here's some of the things that people in my own church have been saying about me. Uh, people in my own church have been saying that I'm a vacuous character, that I'm not all that interesting, and for a public speaker, I'm not all that good at public speaking. In other words, people in my own church have been doing everything they can to discredit me personally and professionally. Now this, think about it, must have been profoundly hurtful for Paul. I'll tell you why. Because Paul started this church in this city. Before Paul showed up in the city of Corinth and taught people about Christianity in the city of Corinth, there was zero Christianity in the city of Corinth. None. So what that means is the person who was saying these hurtful things about him learned his Christianity from him. This is a slap in the face, is it not? I helped you. I did stuff for you. I took you by the hand and led you from where you used to be to where you are today. And now the thanks I get for the help I gave you is you're, you're smack talking me behind my back. You're stabbing me in the back when I'm not listening. It feels wrong. It happened in the life of the Apostle Paul. It's happened to you. I know it has. Someone you helped hurt you. And the reason it feels wrong is because Paul has the right, just like you had the right, to expect better. That's often true of pain. The people who hurt you the most are the people who should have hurt you the least. You are right to say that the people who are in your filing cabinet shouldn't have done what they did. And a part of the reason why it hurt you so much is because it took you by surprise. You would never have imagined that your friend and business partner would have done those things to you. You would never in your wildest dreams have thought that your spouse would have done the things your spouse did. You would have never ever have imagined that your child, that your parent, would have done the things that they did and acted the way they acted. And what would have been doubly hurtful to Paul was that his, this critic wasn't acting alone. Clearly he was a convincing sort of person. And for a time he turned the whole church against the man who started the church. A church where Paul used to be respected and admired and loved was now a church where he was criticised and vilified. So here's what's happening in this sentence on the screen. This man is a part of the church that Paul founded. He discovers Christianity because of Paul's work. He grows in Christianity because of Paul's work. So far, so good. But then he goes off the rails. I don't know why. Maybe he reads some dodgy books. Maybe he listens to some whacked out Preachers on Christian television, the ones with the big hair and the white suits, I don't know. And consequently, he picks up some pseudo-Christian ideas that aren't particularly Christian, 
And he says to this person and that person and the other person, maybe Paul's not so good. Maybe Paul's a bit of a fake. Maybe Paul doesn't have the right ideas. Maybe he isn't telling us the right stuff. Maybe we shouldn't listen to Paul anymore. Maybe we should listen to me. And that's what he did. This guy muscled his way into Paul's place in the church. Still happens in churches today. Paul, as you can imagine, was concerned particularly about this latter point. He's a big boy, I think. He can handle it when people say hurtful things about him. But he can't handle it when a church he started starts to believe unchristian things. So Paul, in the history of the New Testament, he writes a couple of letters to the church in Corinth. They're called 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. Not particularly imaginative titles, but there you go. And in these letters that you can read in the New Testament, Paul gets hardcore. Like, they are not gentle letters. He lays down the law. Stop doing this. Stop doing that. Start doing this. Start doing the other thing. Stop behaving like idiots. Get back on the straight and the narrow. And it worked. One of the things he said in these letters was that for the good of everyone, there should be boundaries. And that guy who's been causing all that trouble, you should put very clear boundaries around that person. Because if you don't, they're going to carry on doing damage. And here's a sentence that I'm about to speak that's worth the price of admission today. I'll pause before I speak it for effect. <coughs> when someone does you wrong, you shouldn't give them permission to keep doing you wrong. Is that reasonable? When someone does you wrong, there is nothing Christian at all about giving them permission to carry on doing it. That's fair, that's sensible, that's logical, and entirely within the purview of the Bible. So this is a simple decision that Paul gave to the church. He said, this fellow has been ruining the church, he's been ruining everything, call him an idiot, throw him out. And that's what happened. Lots of hurt, lots of pain, lots of bad behaviour. Fast forward a few months, a few letters from Paul, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and the church came to their senses, like you do. The church were big enough to admit that they'd been behaving in a wrong way and that they'd hurt Paul. And so they said, you know what, we're sorry. We need to reconcile our relationship with Paul and... Um, and we need to get rid of this guy. So they took this guy, apparently, and they threw him out of the church. We never want to see you again. And that was it. But they didn't forgive him. They took his bad behavior and they stored it away in the filing cabinet. Like a good Scotsman and a good Sicilian, they never forgave and they never forgot. Never. Now Paul, he was deeply hurt by this man, personally, professionally. But Paul is what? Christian. He knows, as a Christian, that Jesus wants him to let things go. To shake things off. To move on from the hurts of yesterday and live differently. And so he writes to the church again regarding this man. And look what he says. He says, if anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. Look at that sentence closely. If anyone has caused grief, what do you mean if? If? Are you, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you joking right now? If? There is no if. This man has caused real and actual hurt. When you look into your past, when you poke around in the things that were said to you and done to you yesterday, you're not imagining any of that. There is no if. If runs the risk of diminishing the hurts that you're carrying around. For me, the word if is almost offensive in this sentence. How dare you say if? If. Has he 
not so much grieved me. No, I'm pretty sure he has grieved you. But he has grieved all of you. And then he qualifies it at the end. Look at the way he ends this sentence. To some extent. Not to put it too severely. You see what Paul's doing in this sentence. He's saying, here's what my Christianity looks like. Yes, I was hurt. Yes, my hurt was real and actual, not feigned and imagined. But please, let's not go on about it. Let's not have a commi commiseration conference on my behalf. Don't feel sorry for me, because I've got no interest in making a big deal out of yesterday. Now that does not mean that what happened yesterday wasn't a big deal. It was a big deal. Just like some of the things that were done to you and said to you were a big deal. Paul is not saying, oh, it was nothing. Don't worry about it. He's just saying, guys, this happened in my past. And I am not holding on to the hurts in my past because what would be the point? So what I want to do is everything I can to minimize not what he did to me in the past, but how I feel about what he did to me in the past. Some of the things that were done to you and said to you are a huge deal. And you are not silly to feel the things that you feel But you might be silly to keep on feeling them. You might be silly to do that thing you do every now and again and choose to poke around in yesterday and draw hurt from yesterday just so you can feel it all over again. How many of you on certain days of the year on certain anniversaries choose to get miserable in advance? <clears throat> How dumb is that? <laughs> oh, it's that day when that thing happened to me. It's coming up. Better get miserable. <laughs> what I love about this sentence is the complete absence of this. You know what? M maybe you are a victim. Maybe you're a victim of bad luck. In life you need luck and maybe you just don't have it. Um, maybe you are a victim of bad parents, of, of bad friends. Maybe you're a victim of making a bad choice in life partner. Who knows? Maybe there is no word of a lie for you to say that you are a victim of what happened to you in the past. Fair enough. No argument from me. But is there any point in carrying on behaving like a victim. Is there any point solidifying your victimhood? What I learn about Christianity in this sentence is that a Christian should be hard to offend because a Christian should have a studied habit of not taking offence. And they should only and they can only do that, it seems to me, if they refuse to feel sorry for themselves. Self pity and unforgiveness are two sides of the same coin. And I would suggest, and this sounds harsh, but I don't care. Feeling sorry for yourself, I get it, but it's a waste of time. It's a waste of time. Then he says, the punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient for him. So this man has been through a process, clearly, that the early church called a binding. So the early, early, early Christian congregations they would take someone who'd been really badly misbehaving, and I mean hardcore bad misbehaving, and they would, they would go through a kind of trial process, I guess, and they would symbolically bind this person's misbehavior to them, and then they would, they, would, they would throw them out of the church. This is what Jesus meant when he said, whatever is bound on earth will be bound in heaven. And, and they were told quite clearly, you're never to set foot in church again. We don't want to see you, we don't want to hear from you, you are persona non grata, you are excommunicado. Now if that happened to you, if you got thrown out of church, this church, that would be no big deal for you. You could just go to the church up the road. They'd have you. That's probably why most of you are in this church in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> Our standards are low. <laughs> And getting lower. <laughs> and, and, and you know, the bar in church should be low. 
I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite proud of, of the fact we are a church for imperfect people. And, and perfect people with perfect lives. Do you know what? I'm happy for you, but you're probably not going to fit in here. Because we're, for the most part, messed up. All right? So, so, so that's okay. But in, in, in early Christianity, it wasn't like that. If you got thrown out of the church in Corinth, there was no other church in Corinth. That was it. So if you were serious about being a Christian in Corinth, and suddenly you couldn't go to the church in Corinth... I don't know what to tell you. Move to Rome. You couldn't go to the church up the street. So this is a huge deal for this guy. And, and so Paul is saying to the church here, look guys, listen, listen, listen. To be Christians in this world, yeah, you've got to take misbehavior seriously and that's one conversation. But, but this is, you've got to let things go. You've got to move on from the past. And so I think this guy, it's time to take him back. It's time to forgive him for what he did. And welcome him back in with open arms. Rather than holding on to the past and reliving the wrong he's done. Here's an idea. Instead, notice the word instead. Instead, you ought to forgive him and comfort him. Whoa. So that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So at the moment it seems this guy is sad. He's sad for two reasons. Reason number one, he's done stuff he shouldn't have done and he's been called on it. That's embarrassing and sad. Number two, he's been thrown out of the church. Now sad, listen carefully, is not good. God, it seems, does not like sad. God does not want people, in the words of the sentence, to be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. But wait a minute, Paul. What about the excessive sorrow you experienced because of him? What about the sleepless nights you had because of him? What about the fact your past would have been a lot more enjoyable if it wasn't for the things he did? Paul it seems shrugs his shoulders in that typically Mediterranean way and says, well, what about it? Him being sad today isn't going to take away my sadness from yesterday. So what's the big deal? What do you want? Now let me take a wee detour here and say that if you've done something you shouldn't have done and you feel badly about it, fair enough. But at some point, you're going to have to find a way of getting over it. You're going to have to find a way of moving on from that thing you feel bad about having done. Because in this sentence we learn that God takes no pleasure in unending despair. He, he doesn't require a person who's, who's sinned to spend a lifetime in depressed introspection. This is why in the Bible... You'll have to take my word for this, I suppose. In the Bible, whenever the subject of forgiveness is discussed, the subject of joy and happiness are never far away. The two go very closely together. So, so you made a mistake, I understand. Welcome to the human race. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about forgiveness. Let me tell you about the cross. Let me tell you about, about how you can move on from what you did. An obsession with misbehavior isn't a virtue, it's a vice. Get over it. And move on with your life. So Paul says, never mind the sadness that this person caused in my life. I'm concerned about the fact he's sad today. God is not in the sadness business. God isn't into sadness. And neither should we be. Have a look at this. Uh, so this is from the Old Testament. Um, a, a bit of the Bible where God sometimes gets a bad rep for being grumpy. But, but, you know, but check this out. This is what the high and lofty one says, God. He who lives forever, God, whose name is Holy God. Here's what he says. I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit. Uh, this is an ancient way of talking about being depressed because of stuff you did. Um, uh, that feeling you feel when you let yourself down. Um, 
If you're sensitive about what's right and wrong, when you say something you shouldn't say and do something you shouldn't do, you feel bad about it. You know the emotion. I know you do. In this sentence, God is saying, I'm with you when you feel bad about your misbehavior. How cool is that? Happens to me all the time. I, I say something I shouldn't have said. I immediately feel like an idiot. In this verse in the Bible, I learned God is never more with me than when I feel like an idiot. When I put my foot in my mouth, morally or verbally. And he is with me to the, vault, to the following end. To revive the spirit. How, could, how would that be right now for you? Lift your spirits. This is what God wants, to lift your spirits. To take that depressed look off your, your face. Lift your spirits. To revive the spirit of the, of the lowly and revive the heart of the contrite. Pick yourself up, in other words. Pick yourself up. That's what I want. I want you to pick yourself up. And I'll help you. He says, I will not accuse forever. I will not always be angry. For then the spirit of man would grow faint before me. The breath of man that I have created. Yeah, I was enraged by his sinful greed. I punished him. I hid my face in anger. Yet he kept on in his willful ways. Sin is never condoned. But look at the last sentence. I have seen his ways. I know what he did. I will heal him. I will guide him. And I will restore comfort to him. So here you have these two ideas in tension in the Bible. A person misbehaves, does something he shouldn't do. He feels badly about it. And the God in heaven who is more offended and enraged by that misbehavior than anyone else desires to undo the sadness caused by this misbehavior. In the short version, I should have probably just said this sentence, God wants us to live with real joy in our hearts. We're in the joy business. And this guy in the church whom you have not forgiven, his own behavior robs joy from his, from his heart, and your lack of forgiveness robs joy from your heart. And we're in the joy business. So let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Next sentence. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. The word reaffirm is, uh, what is it? It's, uh, it's lawyer language, basically, from first century Greek. So it means to formally ratify a treaty. So a nation state would come to a deal with another nation state and this word reaffirm would be used. Paul is saying have a church meeting, like a formal one. And at that church meeting, throw a party for this guy. Publicly say, we're moving on. Bygones are bygones. Let's cut some cake and, I don't know, do some stuff. And we'll just move on from yesterday. And we'll let it go, we'll shake it off, we'll let it go, we'll shake it off. Then he says, if you forgive anyone, I also forgive him. And what have I forgiven? If there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. Notice again how he minimizes all of this. I have forgiven this man. Eh, not that there was much to forgive. He's not faking it here. He's not saying that what this man did was no big deal. He's just saying, you know what, I've learned, and this isn't even a Christian thing. It is a Christian thing, but it doesn't have to be. Even if you're a hardcore atheist, I think this still works. I have learned not to take offense easily. That's cool. I have learned to not let things stick to me. The things they say, the way they behave, the way they treat me, I have learned to be Teflon. When it comes to hurts. And so I forgive. And one of the reasons I forgive theologically. Is in order that Satan might not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. So what the apostle. It's quite extreme language. But what the apostle is saying here. Is unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment. Somehow plays into Satan's hands. What does that mean? Well have a look at this guy. Um. So this fellow is Chris Harper. Um, 
uh, Chris Harper was raised in a Christian home. He, for most of his early adult life, uh, subscribed 100% to a Christian worldview. Um, uh, like many American children, he went to a Christian elementary school and high school and to a Christian university, in his case, Liberty University in Virginia. How hardcore Christian is that? Almost none of us would survive there. Um, and while he worked at, on the campus of Liberty Christian University, he, um, he got involved in Christian radio there, where they played Christian music and Christian sermons. And, and, and um, uh, Chris here has a very satirical sense of humor. God just made him sarcastic. And that wasn't appreciated by the powers that be at Liberty Christian University. So they threw him out of school. They excommunicated him. They said, you're not welcome at school. Don't come back here. Don't set foot on campus. They escorted him off. The, police, the campus police escorted him off. Do not set foot here ever, ever again. Today, Chris Harper runs a satirical atheist website called Landover Baptist Church, which is hardcore atheist and hilarious. But the sadness is that the offensive things that he said about people in the church were never forgiven by the church. And that unforgiveness led, in his case, to an abandonment of faith. What good is bitterness doing anyone? This is what Paul means in this sentence. He says in so many words, Do you want to know why we forgive? Because the price of unforgiveness is too high. We let things go. Because the cost of not letting them go, we cannot afford. We shake things off. We refuse to let anyone steal our joy because the cost of not doing so is too high. 